in his book, The Gray Album on the Blackness of Blackness, poet Kevin Young notes that at its best soul is not simply style or struggle, but strategy. Indeed, social movements that challenge hierarchical power structures and discursive forms such as music. Young's observation speaks to this relationship between the form and informal social movements that challenge these power structures. Highlighted here is the dynamic assemblage of traditions and sensibilities that inform black instantations of what Jurgen Habermas has called the life world, the shared social reality of actions and their meanings in everyday life. The expressing discursive processes that emerge from life world sites such as the street corner, the church, the barbershop, and the juke joint have been integral to the formation of the black public sphere. More than one commentator has used Habermas's theory of the black public of the public sphere as a framework within which to analyze the structure of black political and social life. The bourgeois public sphere, Habermas argues, quote, may be conceived above all as a sphere of private people coming together as a public. They soon claim that the public sphere regulated from above against the public authorities themselves to engage them in a debate over the general rules governing relations in the basically privatized but publicly relevant sphere of commodity exchange and social labor, close quote. In other words, the public sphere can be conceptualized as a mediating realm between the state and private individuals whose societal bonds exceed the purview of their personal lives. As Habermas observes, these private individuals who were male, literate, and members of the bourgeoisie assembled in public coffee houses, salons, and reading societies to generate rational responses to aesthetic and eventually political issues of the day. Sharpened by literary journals, novels, and periodicals, these debates created the rhetorical and analytical tools needed to critique the state. Feminist and African-American scholars have noted the exclusionary framing of the Habermasian public sphere. Their work extends the institutional reach of the public sphere by dislocating white male bourgeois public life as a primary point of departure. Specifically, they observe that Habermas's concept of the public sphere does not capture the social political realities of marginalized communities. Political theorist Michael C. Dawson contends that the black public sphere, like Habermas's public sphere, is an independent realm. Within the black public sphere, the issues, interests, and perspectives that inform black social and political culture are debated. As political scientist Catherine Squires observes, quote, these interests and needs are articulated in a public's attempt, for example, to convince stage actors that opinions of the public should be applied to relevant policy decisions, or that dominant public should reject pejorative definitions of a marginal group's identity, cultural practices, rights, and privileges, close quote. Also like Habermas's public sphere, the multi-class realm of the black public sphere contests systems of stratification that preclude access to favorable outcomes such as life chances, material resources, status, and individual autonomy. Emerging from the black public sphere are a variety of tactics and strategies that helped the reinsertion of black political and social interests into popular discourse. In this sphere, black vernacular music specifically has been integral to shaping practices and institutions that animate the life world. Through vernacular rhetorical strategies such as signifying in the window and double entendre, black men and women imaginatively and publicly use music to reconfigure the power dynamic that shaped their reality. Recorded music specifically has been an effective medium to capture and resound the hidden motivations and instant intentions and aspirations that shape black public life. As historian Shauna Redmond observes, black music, quote, remixes the modalities of the state in order to foster alternative exercises and experiences of freedom and justice, close quote. How then can these political, social, and cultural texts such as recorded music help us to understand the breadth, limits, and potentiality of black political and social culture? This paper details how public soul music, excuse me, popular soul music, recordings that capture the sound and musical interventions in the black public sphere, a box set that anthologizes what we might call the political B-sides of American public life, can be analyzed to uncover the discursive practices and cultural products that informed and formed black social political reality. Black social political culture during the mid-1960s was far from monolithic. 
anti-black attitudes and policies affected individuals and communities in, a, in different ways. The response to these attitudes and policies were equally diverse, often transgressing the boundaries of organized political resistance. In his book, Race Rebels, Culture, Politics, and the Black Working Class, historian Robin D.G. Kelly argues that we must, quote, reject the tendency that dichotomous people's lives to assume that clear-cut political motivations exist separately from issues of economic well-being, safety, pleasure, cultural expression, sexuality, freedom of mobility, and other facts of daily life, close quote. One of the most salient facts of daily life in black community is its rich vernacular music culture. I would argue strongly that during the mid-1960s and early 1970s, soul music emerged as a popular, not obviously political way to change the process of shaping the political and social violences at the center of black life. One of several genres emerging from the popular, black popular music tradition during the post-war era, soul captured the heightened energies of the mid 20th century freedom movement. As black nationalist ideology became more pronounced within black social political culture during the mid to late 1960s, the notion of soul would expand from a gospel-centered, descended musical practice to a secularized means to locate and express individual identity in the public sphere. As ethnomusicologist Portia Mosby and historian Mark Anthony Neal have observed, so apprehended the gestures to musical tropes that inform black vernacular music, refashioning them into an expressive sensibility di that dynamically responded to the call for black power. So not only emerged as a way to publicly signify on black identity, it became embedded into the strategies and everyday choices of black men and women. In other words, soul expanded the attitudes and sensibilities that inform black expressive vernacular culture. It revealed the diverse and dynamic ways that discursive processes are deployed in order to challenge political hegemony and shape reality. A number of scholars have developed frameworks that outline the relationship between the performativity and the social political realities of black Americans. Indeed, these expressive gestures that inform soul performers can comprehend the experience of the life world in ways that words for all of their rational power as communicative action cannot. Musical, musicologist Samuel A. Floyd suggests that, quote, music communicates values associated with the remembrances, anticipation, and interpretations of ordinary living, close quote. Soul embraces this communicative process, staging it in secular ways as embodied narrative. Moreover, it reconfigures the race body from a site of oppression and struggle into what Emily Lordy hails as, quote, a source of compassion, pleasure, and pride. In her essay, Souls Intact, the sole performance of Audre Lorde, Aretha Franklin, and Nina Simone, Lordy argues that academic analysis of soul as essence, musical genre, or commodity fail to recognize the recuperative process that frames the transformation of embodied racialized struggle to survivorship. Setting expressive technique at the center of her analysis, Lordy argues that reconceptualizing soul as narrative makes it easier to imagine the methods and tactics black Americans use to shape their social political life world through culture production. Analyzing specific performances by artists such as Aretha Franklin, Lordy places black women at the center for this cultural narrative. She argues that though that through multigenerative virtuosity, Black women artists established multiple expressive homes within social political realm that lack hospitable expressive systems. Lordy's intervention celebrates the diverse strategies employed by black Americans to define themselves, challenge normative attitudes, reconcile their inter-community conflicts, and establish autonomy over their lives. Advancing Lordy's analysis, I want to theorize throwing ugly to introduce an additional degree of nuance to the conversation surrounding black public life, identity, and soul. First introduced by author R.J. Smith to dramatize a sonic aesthetic created by James Brown during his celebrated 1962 performance at the Apollo Theater. I used Throwing Ugly to, in order to dissenter the hypermising framing of legitimization to, and reveal the equal effectiveness of alternative discourses, modes, and processes in the black public sphere. For black communities, developing social political life while communicating with power required survival schemes that were simultaneously subversive and empowering. 
Throwing Ugly apprehends this process, encoding itself within the communicative strategies that have contested normalized categories of black life. Additionally, this approach is influenced by the scholarship of sound and performance theorist A. Sean Crawley. In his essay, Noise, Church, Flesh, Crawley explores the relationship between black social life, expressive culture, and sound. Observing that, quote, noise produced for me a way to see worlds, close quote, uh, Crawley theorizes that black expressivity, when juxtaposed against dominant social political culture, is itself a type of noise. He writes, music in its finality is but one way to organize noise. And black music is all about that noise. Black music lets noise happen, organizes with and sometimes against it. Black music is the gathering of the dark matter of noise, gathering and rather than dispensing with the materiality of as inconsequence, using it in the cause of being moved. Indeed, the ways in which black men and women navigate the world that they inhabit manifest themselves in imaginable ways. Strategies, these strategies speak to the racial, to the radical expressive tradition that informed black public life. As noise, this tradition antagonizes, undermines, and disturbs liberal bourgeois attitudes that inform dominant culture. The ugly, I contend, is useful in exploring soul's role in organizing, silent out these strategies, tactics, and conventions that inform black public life. These conventions are announced in the 1972 live performance of Aretha Franklin's Dr. Feelgood. One of several songs recorded over three nights at San Francisco's celebrated rock venue, the Fillmore West, Dr. Feelgood is a 12-bar blues that conjures a specific resistance sensibility that is in and of the black popular music tradition. The discourse surrounding the blues women of the 1920s are an example, introducing an alternative discourse that black to black life and into the black public. These women spoke truth to power 12 bars at a time embedded within the howls, growls, moans, yeah, dominant sevens, was a narrative that authenticated a negotiation of black life that, though not respected, was entirely legitimate and compelling. Directing our, tradition, directing our attention towards the transition between Dr. Feelgood and the penultimate psalm performed that evening, Spirit in the Dark, we hear this narrative being deployed. Send me no doctor. Fill me up with all of those pills. Cause I got me a man named Doctor Feel Good. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I can't Taking care of business is surely and truly this man's game. Hello, mister. And after one visit to Dr. Feelgood, you'll understand why. me feel real good. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
one could read this moment as a performance of a certain mode of worship within black religiosity. What Neil observes as, quote, the Holy Ghost or spirit possession inherent to the black church, close quote. Alternatively, I argue that the seamless exchange of tropes, gestures, and expressive devices speaks directly to the sonic aesthetic conventions that inform the black musical tradition. Samuel Floyd's theory of call response is useful here. Floyd argues that call response can be conceptualized stylistically as a fluid exchange of gestures and methods, themselves germane to other styles of music and recreative performance styles and genres thus signify upon one another. Advancing Floyd, I argue that the transition between Dr. Feelgood and Spirit in the Dark not only resists a liberal bourgeois reading of black vernacular music, but it provokes a rewriting of aesthetic code. In other words, black musical performance deploys expressive technique and stylized process in order to respond to and revise aesthetic sensibility and redefine public space. This process is central to Aretha Frank's performance at the Fillmore West a principal site within 1960s and, 19, and 70s hippie culture. The Fillmore was home to devotees of bands such as Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead. Aretha was initially unwilling to appear at the venue as producer Jerry West recalls in his her bio biography, Respect the Life of Aretha Franklin. Aretha, she was afraid that she wouldn't understand or that they wouldn't relate to her. She had, after all, come out of gospel and R&B. Aretha, however, was mistaken. Organist Billy Preston remembers, it wasn't that the hippies just liked her. Nah, they, they went out of their minds. They lost her completely. The hippies, they flipped the fuck out. <laughs> Speaking of Dr. Feelgood and Spirit in the Dark specifically, celebrated pianist and vocalist Ray Charles said, she turned into church. And I highlight this episode that enjoys Dr. Feelgood and Spirit of the Dark in order to briefly to detail the imaginable ways black vernacular music is deployed in order to resist and reconstitute how black public life is defined as lived performance, as live performance. This moment collapses sacred and secular sensibilities into each other, producing an expressive and sonic aesthetic that not only resisted and reconfigured the aesthetic conventions that define the film more, but how music performance is engaged within black public life. Albums such as Live at the Film More West were a discursive medium that captured the spectrum of expressivity that informed a black social political culture, circulated amongst various groups within the black public via discursive institutions such as black radio. These albums dispatched narratives that shaped identity and foster debate regarding the potentiality of black life. So not only offers us a way to explore the nuances within black musical performance, but how expressive gestures within specific cultures continue to shape the social political realities of black subjects. Indeed, black vernacular music is noise, a joyful noise hollowed above the drone-like commentary that aims to shrink the ever-expanding breath of black personhood. Undoubtedly, this current social and political climate has demanded that we amplify ourselves, that we vibrate higher, higher, that we black harder. Yes, I said that we black harder, as Donnie and Roberta remind us. I was overcome by your, your rhetorical thunder at the end there, then I joined in on the clap. Um, questions and comments, please, from the, from the group. If you could raise your hand, we'll bring a speaker, a, a microphone. Braxton, please. great presentation. Uh, not to bring your paper to bear on mine, but I, I wonder if you thought about C.L. Franklin in relationship to what Aretha does there um, and his, uh, so 
his, you know, highly musical um, preaching. Um, it just reminded me of that when I saw that clip. You can't help but think of the Reverend C.L. Franklin when you hear Aretha uh, in everything that she does. I mean, the one sermon that comes to mind is the eagle stirs the nest, right? Uh, but it's, 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 like, it's everything about Aretha and that intersection of, of sacred and secular tropes that she deploys in a, rather, in a rather creative and personalized but recognizable way and how she's able to pull from these traditions that have, that have em, empowered us, that have sustained us, right? Uh, and I also hear Mahalia, right? I, I hear Clara Ward in that. I, I, I hear the black gospel tradition. I hear hooping. Uh, I, I hear her foregrounding Reverend Barber. It's, it's so much that you can just literally pull from that. And that literally, for, for me, I draw a connection between this album and Amazing Grace. And that, or either a direct connection between this moment and let's say Holy Holy or maybe you've got a friend, precious Lord. It's all this, this, this spectrum and continuum of expression and direct commentary to the black lived experience. Thanks, Wade, for this wonderful paper. I was really compelled by your discussion of the black the public sphere and the reclamation of black noise its signification and its, uh, in some ways, musicalization. And yet I wonder if the, the constant kind of symbolic need to defend black noise as, uh, as signifying has that specter of uh, white ears, basically. And whether the category of black noise already implies that it is deemed noise because some people aren't listening uh, in an appropriate way because there were uh, stronger efforts to dismantle structural racism or valuation based on aesthetics that were contingent on various uh, you know, injustices that really the problem, the so-called problem with, uh, with black noise is, is the white ears. And I was wondering speak to the two sides of the tension between Sure. Uh, well, this is just a waypoint, uh, and I've thought about that as well. And the reason I, I brought in the idea of this idea of throwing ugly and black noise is that, it, yes, it starts off as noise, and then it gets normalized, right? And, these are, and it's not only a musical expression, it's also a subjective expression, right? Uh, as popular culture tends to gather it together. So for example, I'm a jazz musician, and uh, I can only speak to this. One of my favorite, as you say, extensions or alterations is the sharp 11. It's for some reason, it just makes me feel good on the inside. And at one point, this sharp 11 sound was rather dissonant. But now it's something that kind of gives, uh, any, when, you, when you listen to popular music, that certain character, right? So it starts off as noise. It will always start off as noise. But my contention is to, let's say, white ears, that sooner or later you will, you will have to love this noise. In fact, when you gather this noise, it will no longer be noise. And then, the, 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 for me, the, the nature of marginalized communities is that we always project noise to some way. And it will be gathered, and it will be normalized, and it will be the, uh, a veneer of constants will put, be veiled over it. And then we'll come up with no more, more noise, and more noise. I contend that I will always be noisy, right? Because you, I will never be normalized, but I will be me, right? And that's this idea of owning space, owning my own space, that type of thing. Oh, great. Okay, well, we'll thank uh, Wade Dean for a really wonderful paper. Thank you so much.